Great Thou Art was originally written by Carl Boberg in 1885. The song we now know was translated by Stuart K. Hine in 1949. When he did his translation, Hine set it to a Swedish folk melody and arranged that melody to fit its words. The scripture reference for this popular hymn is Psalm 48, 1, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being such a great God provided for so many things for us, for our salvation, for our hope and strength in eternity, but also, too, you provided so much for us in this life, for minds that think and ears that hear and eyes that can see, and for all the material blessings that you pour down upon us. Lord, we're just so grateful. Father, receive these gifts from these folks as we reach out into the community and also as we continue to worship you to your glory and to our strength. In Jesus' name, amen.
Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Come before our Lord with our prayers and supplications to Him. Father in heaven, we just give you praise and thanksgiving for this day. And for the privilege to come before you and lay all our concerns and worries to you. Today, Father God, we know our nation is in great need of our prayer. A lot of changes, a lot of things that are going on that are not pleasing in your sight. I pray, Father God, too, that you will help us, Lord, to uh, pray for our nation even more so than ever before. I pray, Father God, especially for those who are not on the same plane with you, Lord, and it seems as almost the damaging our nation. I just pray, Father God, that you will bring that to an end and that you will bring people to understand you and your ways even better than they knew themselves. I pray, Father God, too, for the great military and the people that work our streets every day to keep us safe, keep us from harm, and for those that have also bear the losses because of that. This week, again, many officers, five of them I know, uh, that I know of in the nation have died. And we just pray, Father God, for that long blue line as they continue to protect, be with loss of fire. EMS and those who protect us. I pray for our city government. I pray, now, I pray right now for the choice that is being made for a chief for our city. I pray for a, a Chief Livingston as he takes over in the interim period and give him a blessing, Father. And Father, I pray also, too, for the many in our congregation that are hurting, that are sick. Some are going through some difficulties in marriages. Some are going through difficulties with children. Some are having difficulties with their health. We lift them up to you right now, some that we know and some that we don't even know. I pray, especially for Bill Bannister, Lord. I pray for his healing. I pray for him as he battles his uh, disease and also, too, now that he's found out that he's got uh, cancer again, Lord, that's come back as a military veteran, Lord, and uh, the challenges that that has brought in his body. I pray also, too, for Evelyn and for Lucille and Karen and Kay and Joyce, all are homebound, Lord, and I just pray for their strength and their endurance as they go through being kept at a place they can't go out and be free like they were at one time. I pray also, too, Father, for those that are sick. I think of those that are battling COVID right now, or the Gillies, as their daughter now has come down with it. I pray also to Father God for Officer Gum and also Samantha Mama, Mama, who is both also battling cancer. I pray also too for Betty's uh, brother-in-law who had hip surgery and for Tom <coughs> and uh, the struggles that he's had with health for Sarah. I pray also too for the Hodges family and the Coslett family and the, I pray for the Guile family as they mourn the loss and the Pickering family. All these who have had loved ones lost this past month and a half. I pray also too, Father, um, for the baby that was born to 
um, the Greer family and for their mom and baby were health as it was a very risky delivery. But thank you, God, uh, they're both fine and healthy and strong. I pray also, too, Father God, for those who we know that are addicted, that are in the monkeys on their back. For Ryan, for Jordan, for David, for Eric, for Ricky and Mitch. These young people, Lord, who have brought this on, but yet now it owns them. And we just pray for relief for them. We pray also, too, for Karen's um, friend <clears throat> who uh, has this cancer, who's 29 years old, God this tumor. I just pray, Lord, that the doctors can find a way or you will bring the healing, Lord. And Father, there's others on our minds and on our hearts that are going through difficulties in their lives that we know of. Lord, as we lift them up by name, we know you know exactly what's going on. Hear our prayers, Lord. now, Father, take your word and open it up to us. It's living. It's active. We want to hear it, Lord. Speak to us, Lord, for your children want so much to hear from you. And it's through Jesus Christ we pray this. Amen. Have you ever been in a place where you stuck out like a sore thumb? Minister in South Texas in a very small country town preached the word vibrantly, and one day a rich Texan came through from Dallas and heard him preach and was so impressed by his use of the word of God and going through it step by step by step that when his pastor at the large church in Dallas left the pulpit, he went down and inquired about the man, and he was still in the ministry, and he was, took the call to that church. Well, they were going to have an open house for this pastor, and they said an invitation out to the whole congregation and said, you're invited to our home, which was this huge mansion, and dress casual. Well, the preacher had been in his sight and two, all his tie and suit all week, and he thought casual was jeans, a denim shirt, a Stetson cowboy hat, and his cowboy boots. And when him and his wife, the pastor and his wife, showed up to the door, and the door opened, the man's wife was in a long evening gown, and he was almost dressed up with a tie and jacket like he was got his tux on. Needless to say, they both were very embarrassed, and they stuck out like a sore thumb. And they had a hard time even looking people in the eyes. Well, today, the Apostle Paul again comes to us, in the society that we're in, and basically we're going to stick out like a sore thumb. Because Paul's going to get down pretty hot and heavy in the scriptures today, and many of the people in our society would laugh, if not think that we're old-fashioned and we don't fit into society anymore. But Paul knows God's word, and it's forever. It doesn't change. Society changes, culture changes, but God's word never changes. And so the Apostle Paul preaches on these important relational principles that we need to have in our lives. And we need to use for the glory of God. And he first starts out because the people of Corinth had questions. Now if you remember where Corinth was and what it was going on there, Paul writes... Now, concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. And the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife, her husband. And the wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. And likewise, so the husband does not have authority over his body, but the wife does. So stop depriving one another except for agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, if you remember, Paul founded this church of Corinth. 
And Corinth was situated, and on the mountaintop was the, the temple of Aphrodite. She was the fertility god, sex goddess. And she would send a thousand prostitutes every night into Corinth to work their wares. And we know that uh, basically Vegas would be probably like Mayberry IFD, RFD if they were here and saw what was going on in Corinth. Because what they believed, the Corinthian people believed about Aphrodite is that a meteor had come down and struck the mountain. And what had happened was came out this fertility goddess that they called her Aphrodite. And she had all breast on her. And everybody went to the temple in case they, they were having problems with a baby. They would pray to Aphrodite so they could have children. And it was a temple that was huge. And the top of prostitutes were working very steadily. And there was much immorality in Corinth then because the values system were such perversions because of this whole thing. And the Christians of that now that had come out of this, Paul had been there for a year and a half. He had left and now they're having problems. They write questions to him about the sex issue and about marriage. And the question they have is, should people be abstinent in every way, even in their marriages? And, they were, <clears throat> and there was confusion among them. And as you know, there are some who were saying, it doesn't matter what you do. That's the Gnostic philosophy or theology, which was whatever you do with your body, it doesn't connect with your spirit. And so they would do whatever they felt comfortable with, even involved with prostitution. On the other hand, though, there were Corinthians in the church who were saying it does matter. In fact, they had become so strict, they were saying, should we abstain from even sex in marriage? And should we be celibate in our marriages unless to have children? And Paul is saying, no, this is not something. Sex is not dirty. Sex was created by God for several purposes. Yes, it was created to have children, but even more so before that, God says in Genesis chapter 2 that it's for unity. The, the husband and wife are to come together and be one. And Paul even emphasizes that there's only depriving of it for a little while for prayer and devotion. Otherwise, sex is to be used as a tool to continue that unity. And in fact, even Paul sees it as a way to prevent perversion from entering into the home and for the husband to go outside the home looking for sex. And so here we see the two different sides of it. And Paul speaks very clearly about this whole idea and that basically a woman and a man are to have these relationships in order to prevent outside the marriage sexuality, but also that we see that it's not dirty, but it's for a husband and wife. In fact, it's interesting that the Bible never says lust is wrong in the marriage. It's only when we're lusting and looking outside the marriage that that is when it's wrong. And that celibacy is only for those who are single. And that marriages should be an honorable estate in which this wonderful activity that God has given to us to bring unity to one another. And that Paul then goes on to speak here and that <clears throat> he says, and this is interesting because our society doesn't believe this. If you listen to some of those who are in the abortion camp, they say, my body, you're not going to tell me what I can do with my body. No, it's not your body. It's God's body who created you. And you are given this body to glorify God. And you're also given this body so that when you marry, your body is no longer yours. It's your spouse's. The body of a man, his wife, it's his wife's body now. And the man, his wife's body is his body. And the two are mutually and not exclusive. But what they are is together, they're one in Christ. And so no longer do you own yourself. Or you can't use it as a selfish thing, but that you two honor God with your body. And in this moral malaise, you know, that they've got going on in Corinth. Paul has got to spell this out to them. And make sure they do not deprive each other. You see, they're making a moral knee jerk. Those folks who want to be very honoring God to the point where they're going beyond what God ever wanted. Back in Genesis, God had already instated this. 
And that's the only reason to stop is because of devotions, prayer, and a short time, he says. Otherwise, he sees it as preventative of immorality, and it's a great resource. Now, one of the things that we need to talk about here while we're here is a problem that we have in our society today that's made things complicated. Friday night, we had students from the school here. We had parents, and the FBI came and made a presentation about pornography on the Internet and how children can get easily lured in and doing some things where they could even be blackmailed into doing other things because they're being blackmailed and be told that if you don't do this, we're going to send your pictures to your mom or to your dad or extort money out of them, or sex extort them, and then sell their pictures on the internet. And <clears throat> the officers were here, and they were talking about situations that they dealt with with children about this very thing. And a little girl in the audience here starts talking, and she talks more than she should have because she says, I'm on the internet with a man who I don't know, and she's connected with this guy. And she's been talking with him. And as they talked, they realized that she's been being primed. And so they said, we're going to talk to you after with your parents and help her to fix this thing. But it's a tragedy. And this is what happens in our world. And, <clears throat> and so here, the Bible here speaks to us about it because it's a problem in the church. And it's a huge elephant that the church never deals with or talks about. But it's huge. Today we know Advertising uses sex to sell everything. In fact, sometimes you sit there in the advertisement and wonder what they're advertising because uh, the sexual explicit stuff are so great, you can't even tell what they're selling until the ultimate end. We see it in TV and movies. And sex sells. Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Madonna. And we realized that, and, and this is something that shocked me. I knew that they were making billions of dollars. But they said... <clears throat> that it was making over millions of dollars in Hollywood only made $10 billion a year. And pornography was making more than that. In fact, they even said that pornography that's being sold yearly makes more than Major League Baseball, NFL, and NBA. Makes more money than all those three corporations that are going on. And it says that the church has 50% of the men in the church and 20%, and I don't know how they got these statistics, are addicted to pornography. And we need to understand this in the church. We may have friends that are involved with it as Christians. We need to help them because it's a huge issue. And one of the things the word speaks about is epithume, which means a strong desire or lust. And that desire... Jesus used that word when he said, I'm desiring to have Passover just before he died. And it's a very strong word. But also it's used in the scripture on a negative side for attraction to sexual activity. And the Bible here is speaking to us about this. That men and women, both men with their eyes and women with their emotions, that it's easy to get locked in and hooked. I remember sharing to a group of young people that were doing drugs in the park one time. And they said, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. I was, a, you know, and they were given all kinds of examples of how they were this best um, uh, altar boy and all this. And then I said, but uh, let me ask you something. Jesus said something in the Sermon on the Mount that maybe we can talk. He said, if you look upon a woman lustfully, it's like committing adultery. He said, no way. Yeah, way. We all know that from Scripture. And what we want people to understand that the word of God is that we are to surrender our minds and our bodies to Christ and then to our spouse. And that if not, we are making perversion here. And especially with pornography that we have readily available on our phones, on our computers. And we unshackle that by first understanding what is the trigger to my lust what triggers me to get me to go down that road? Jesus talked about the eye gate and not allowing anything in your eyes. And James talks about everyone is tempted. 
And we need to know what those triggers are and avoid them. We know it, for instance, James talks about, it's like putting your foot into the water and then going in a little deeper and then a little deeper and all of a sudden you get swept away by the current. And he says, that's what happens with our lust and how easy it is to get caught into that. And now we also need to know then how to control those triggers, how to get away from it. And it's so confusing because it's in all the literature, a lot of literature, it's in a lot of the stuff we watch on TV. There's a lot of stuff that artists write and speak about that are there too. And the Bible here speaks to us very importantly and says that one of the things you need to do is just turn off your computer. Or once you see those things coming in, walk out and get out of it right away. And <clears throat> we see that happen with David. He was on top of the roof. And here Bathsheba is on her roof bathing. He needed to walk away and go and look someplace else. He needed to train his eyes to think on something pure and holy. When you see a woman or a man in, in the gym, that you pray for them rather than look at their body and lusting after them. We need to train that. This is what Job says in Job 31.1. He says to us, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And how then could I gaze on a young woman? And when you see that young woman, you pray for her. You pray for her salvation. You pray for her heart. You pray for her family so that it can divert your thinking away from it. It's kind of like a woman who had, was very wealthy and she was trying to get a driver for her Rolls Royce. And so she gets three guys, applicants, and she says to them, one of the first questions she says is, how close can you come to getting to a wall without scratching my Rolls Royce? One of them says, well, I can do a foot. The second guy says, well, I can do six inches. And the third guy says, I drive that Rolls Royce to the other side of the parking lot. Guess who she hired? The one who went on the other side of the parking lot. And this is what God calls us to do today, folks, that we shut that line off. And cut it off. Husbands, we are responsible for our wives. And wives, we're responsible for our Help us to work together so that we can have this sacred marriage. That we can stand together. And that we can look into the scriptures and follow God's way for marriage. This is what the Corinthians were hungering to know. Because they were almost going to the other extreme so that they could honor God. And that was not God's way either. God had made marriage and, and sex and marriage for a purpose. Then the second thing he says, if you're a Christian married to a non-Christian, but to the married I give instructions, not I, but to the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. If he does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if a man of a brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, he consents to live with her, he must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For the otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if the unbelieving leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such a case, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? And Paul is giving guidelines now, because what had happened was people had come to know Christ through his ministry, but they were married to unbelievers, and they didn't buy into the Christian faith. And so Paul is now speaking to them and giving them guidance about marriage and how to handle the situation. And one of the things he talks about is divorce. And he says, if you are married to somebody who's an unbeliever, do not leave them for the faith. No, continue to grow in the faith and realize that you are not going to save them. Them being connected to you doesn't save them. What it does, though, it sanctifies them, that you are drawing them closer to Christ 
the more you live with them and the more you show Christ in your life, you're being the sanctifying process in which they can come to know Christ and therefore stay in that marriage. Work towards that and do not leave your spouse. But if they consent and they want to leave, you're free to let them go. But if they want to stay, that you continue to do the sanctifying work through your living as a Christian in this marriage. And that you continue to go on sharing the gospel and showing them the gospel of the way you live and the way you are. And that <clears throat> do not, and one of the things that happens is a lot of people when they get divorced, they rebound immediately into a marriage that's not healthy for them. And he says, don't do that either. Rather, it's to exercise self-control. And that, <clears throat> number one, that they remain in the singleness and that they stay themselves pure for the Lord. Um, and because that marriage, in fact, that physical act does not change does not change if you've committed yourself to the Lord in marriage to that person. You're, even though you're divorced by concession of the Lord, by Moses' decree, it does not end that relation. You're still connected to that person. That's why it's so important that we understand what Scripture has to say about divorce. And he talks about then the problems that can easily come. Now, he talks especially about being unequally yoked. I know couples who were, for instance, I know a gal that was a Christian, and she disobeyed the word of God. And she became become unequally yoked with a young man. And they were married, and she continued to walk with Christ, but he did not. And it wasn't until their seventh, I think it was their fifth child, and their oldest son would say, because she was a, um, in our church, she was a Sunday school superintendent, and she also was a teacher, and yet her husband was not a believer. And finally, one day, her son, our oldest son, was about seven, went to her and said, Dad, how come you don't go to church? Why don't you go to a church? Well, do you know the Lord? Well, that woke that father up. And they wound up going, he wound up going to church the following weekend with them and he went forever and the beautiful thing about it he came to know Christ and it was God's grace totally because she was so disobedient but yet she the Lord she still walked in the Lord and worked at sanctifying that relationship and God used that little child to bring him to Christ and <clears throat> the key is is that we and this is a tragedy sometimes young Christians get themselves into they think they have to be married Paul in this passage today speaks to us and says, be content where you are. And God will provide you. If he wants you to be married, he will make that happen. If he wants you to remain single, he will make that happen. But if you're in a marriage with somebody who's an unbeliever now, you don't divorce him, but rather stay with him and hopefully they will sanctify him. And if they choose to leave, that's another story. You're free. But it's so easy, and this is what happens sometimes. People get emotionally involved with relationships, and they make mistakes. And I remember I had a young lady who I tried to help, and she felt that she had to be married. And she met this guy, and they got married, and she asked me to marry him, and I wouldn't, because I knew his background. And she thought that was the guy for her. And I knew that he had two felony convictions on abuse. And that <clears throat> I told her not to marry him. And she knew all this, but she still refused and married him. And I'll never forget, Sandy and I had been in, on, in New York for vacation during the Christmas holidays. And when I came back, my first call was her. And she had called me from the hospital, St. Joe's Hospital, because she had married the guy. And they had gotten into a fight, and he threw her down the staircase and broke her pelvis. And I, immediately, it just it tore me apart inside because this could have been all been averted if she would listen to the Word of God and done what the Word of God said. Instead, she got emotionally involved with the guy. He told her all kinds of nice things about him. That's not him anymore. And she believed it, and she fell prey to all his falseness. The Bible here is taking to us, though, it's saying to us, 
It, it, if you're un, with an unbeliever, stay with them and pray for them and continue to work at the sanctification for them. And whether or not they want to stay, that's on them. But you continue to walk with that person in Christ. <clears throat> then the Word of God speaks to us further here, and, and it says to us about unmarried couples, people who are struggling, or people who enjoy marriage, and they want to share it with someone else. Now, <clears> that's <throat> interesting. The Apostle Paul was married at one time, they believe. They believe because he was a Pharisee, and a Pharisee was not able to be a Pharisee unless they were married. And they believe something happened with his wife and that she possibly died um, while he was ministering. And, that, um, and this is why he speaks very boldly to unmarried Christians who in their church again in Corinth were wondering, do we get married? Is it okay from God's perspective that we get married? Or should I remain single and celibate and be like a priest or a, a nun? We know in the Catholic Church, for instance, they have adopted the position that the priests are to be celibate, single, and the nuns are supposed to be celibate and single. And in the Protestants, we are free to do what we feel God has called us to do, to be married or to be single. And, you know, <clears throat> it all depends on what you sense God is saying to you, and it's for his glory. And some of us do better, well, and, you know, some people, too, they get delusional and they think, well, if I wasn't married, I'd be better off. No, 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 no. God doesn't say that. He says, if you're married, stay married because you should be content within yourself in Jesus Christ. If you're single, you should be content. And if you sense that you need to get married, it's not a sin, but it's for the glory of God. And so the Apostle Paul comes and speaks about, to, especially to the single person. It's interesting how not many people hear that much about this. But only to the Lord has assigned each one. As God has called each in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct all the churches. And so what he's saying is where you're at, your position in life is where God has directed you. And you should be contented with that. Then he goes on to say, for he who called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. <clears throat> Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You are bought with a price, so do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in the condition in which he is called. Now, Paul uses two illustrations. One is the idea of slavery, which he says if you're a slave and you're basically, if you want to be freed, you can pay your way out of it. Or you can stay as a slave, and if your owner wants to set you free. And this was all accepted in this culture. And basically, he says, but the important thing is you be contented where you are. He speaks the same thing as a second illustration about circumcision. You want not to be circumcised. And he uses that illustration and says, don't become uncircumcised or don't be circumcised, but rather be content where the Lord has you. Now, he uses the same thing about being married or single. And the whole idea is contentment as to where you are. And that's why in verse 25 through 27, he speaks about the young single women in the congregation. And they're single. Some of them were single because they have not been married yet. Others were single because they were divorced. And he speaks to um, um, other singles. Um, I'm trying. I'm losing track where the third one comes out of. But anyway, um, <clears throat> he uh, divorced, and some who had lo lost loved ones by death. So there's three types of single, and he commands them. He says, "Look what he says in verse 25." Now concerning the virgins, I know command you the Lord, but I give you option as to one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. And I think then that it is good to view the present distress. That is good for a man to remain as he is. You see, Paul is saying, I'm single. And I realize that the time is coming that the Lord's wrath is going to come. And look what's going on. He says, it's easier to you to minister as a single. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to release. You see, again, Paul is speaking to these Christians who are wrestling with, do I stay married because then I, uh, I'm tied down by this wife and having to take care of her and the children? 
Are you bound <clears throat> to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? And do not seek a wife. One of the tragedies I studied here in the passage that I was going through was <clears throat> two men who I've held highly in my ministry, which was one was John Wesley, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the other one was uh, Wilberforce, uh, not Wilberforce, um, Witherspoon, and both of them were evangelists in, in back in the 1900s. And tragically, they said Wesley's wife left him because he was out preaching so much that she didn't want to, she got tired of waiting for him to come home and just left him, walked out on the marriage. <clears throat> and that, that's not a good witness, but also, too, he's not being faithful to his wife. And then on the other hand, you know, uh, Wilber, Wilberforce's, not Wilberforce, but, um, Whitfield's wife was very much alone a lot. We see John Bunyan also. He was in prison for a long time, and his wife had to care for their ten children alone. And this is all the tragedy. <clears throat> and that's why Paul is stressing that being single is not a bad thing, because it's important that you understand that you can serve the Lord with more time and not have to give answer or have to worry about your wife's needs also. And that's why the, you know, the Catholic Church has gone with the priesthood and, the, and, and nuns is because they don't have to be worried, but only for serving Christ. Now, the other thing that, that the passage touches on here for us, too, is to understand that there are young people who believe that if they're not married, um, they're, 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 they feel less of a person. That's not true. Paul says if you're not married, you can serve the Lord more effectively for his glory. And it's interesting, we are in a society right now that we have left, really married, back in 1950, 78% of America was married. Today, it is interesting, but only 48% of the households have a husband and wife. And <clears throat> we're living in, in a singles culture, we're moving to a singles culture. And half of the births are by unwed mothers. 30% of millennials think that they want to have a successful marriage, whereas Gen X's were 47%, which was taken in 1997. And four out of the ten Americans today believe marriage is becoming obsolete. So we got to think this way when we're witnessing to people and talking to them about our marriages and about our lives. This is what's going on in our society today. And there's so many myths out there uh, about marriage, and it's chasing people away. And we need to make sure people have a straight understanding of God's development of marriage even in our own lives, have been affected by this type of thinking in our society. Marriage is looked down upon a lot of times in our, if you watch the sitcoms, marriage between a husband and wife is made fun of. The married man who stays with his wife and, and remains with her in the unity, it's made fun of. Why? Because the social engineers of our society are trying to break down the Christian value system. Swapping has become a big thing, a big sport in some developments that go on in America today. And the tragedy is that we know we've seen a lot of divorce in this country and the myth of the greener grass, that people think if they have that another person, they're going to be happy. You know, if you're not content, and this is what Paul is saying, if you're not content in your own heart, the position you're in, you are not going to be happy in another state. So get that out of your head and realize that you need to be content where you are in Jesus Christ. And the only one who can bring you that contentment is Jesus Christ. And that's why when we come to the word of God and we understand where we're at in our lives, you may be dissatisfied right now with your marriage. You may be dissatisfied because you're a single person. Well, ask yourself the question, is it dissatisfaction because of them or is it me? And Paul comes down on the side here. You're to be content where you're at in Jesus Christ. And that contentment comes not from that person. If you're married, stay married. If you're single, stay single. But he says your contentment needs to come through Jesus Christ. 
He's the only one who can bring you the true happiness that you're looking for. No other person can fill. You know, it's amazing to me. Some people think that, that when they marry this person, all their problems are going to be solved. They're going to be happy and content and not lonely. I've met some of the most lonely people in marriages. And their view of that person solving their problem of loneliness, they find that they're more alone in that relationship. And very, very sadly, they're unsatisfied. And the widower who struggles, it's okay for her to remain single. It's okay to marry if you feel God leading you to a person who's a Christian. Not every Christian, too, is made for you. There are Christians who have great problems in their lives. And you need to be aware of that so that you don't get caught up into their stuff. And Paul speaks to this here. And he says, first and foremost, be content who you are. Look what he says in verse 28. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will, such will have trouble in life. And I am trying to spare you because he knows the challenges that marriage can bring. And especially in the age that they were living in. But I say, brethren... The time has been short, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they have none. He sees the coming of Christ and is fearful for the, the people of that generation, especially in Corinth. But I want to be free from concern, and this is why Paul lands on the side of the unmarried, because it's easier to be concerned with the things of the Lord and how to please the Lord, but one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. And so that's why Paul comes out strongly about this. But he says it's okay to marry. If that's where you sense God to be with you, that's where you're going to be most effective. And if you're content in that, if you're content in Christ, and you really feel and sense this is where he wants you to be, then you go for it. The husband is, not, is, is bound as long as his wife lives. But if his husband is dead, she is free to be married in whom she wishes only in the Lord. Again, notice the inclusion, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, he is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And Paul is giving the option. He is telling us the key to it all is make sure you are content where you are. And don't think somebody else is going to bring that to you. Don't think your condition or circumstances change. That's going to make you happy. It has to be your contentment in Jesus Christ. Jesus can only make your life secure. Jesus is the only one that can give you the strength for your life. Jesus is the only one who can give you satisfaction in your life. Jesus is the only standard for our lives. And so when we live in that, we're at peace. Today, I hope if you get anything out of this, message today. Paul says it well, and I love when he says it in First Philippians chapter 4, 11. And let me close with this quote. And this is where we all need to be, whether we're married or whether we're single. He said, now that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. Philippians 4, 11. Let that be our heart today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that speaks to many situations and many circumstances. And I just pray everybody here will lean on you fully for their joy, for their peace, and especially for their contentment. That, Lord, they can be content where they are, and that, Lord, they can be the sanctifier in their homes in their marriages, so they can bring peace to their home and joy. They can satisfy their partners and their partners satisfy them. That they can have peace, Lord, in that home. And for those that are single, Lord, and that you're calling them to life, that they can also be content in where they are. And that, Lord, if they're meant to have a partner, that they will be led to do so. And that they can find their contentment still in you, Lord, and that their marriages can be effective and healthy and secure in you, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here with us through your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray.
Amen. Please rise for the benediction. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God your Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. God.